Good morning. Only three people in this house. Good morning. Happy resurrection morning. You're not excited enough, guys. Happy resurrection morning. This is a crown or the jewel on the crown of the church. Amen? Without the resurrection, there can be no Christianity. That's what separates us from every other faith or religion that we have a living Savior. Jesus is alive without any dispute. There's no other faith or any religion that can lay claim to that. All their founders are dead and they are buried and they remain in the grave and they will never rise until Jesus comes again. Praise God. But as for us, we have a living Savior. And we're here this morning to celebrate the life that we have as a result of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Amen. So we have a wonderful production this morning. And the theme is, Worthy is the Lamb. But we believe that the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world is worthy of our worship, is worthy of adoration, is worthy of every ounce of praise that we can offer. Amen. <clears throat> Let us be upstanding briefly. Let's just pray as we come into this production. We acknowledge those online. Thank you for joining us. God bless you. We also welcome those that are visiting among us. God bless you. Thank you for making our time for being with us. And we pray that you will encounter the resurrection power of Jesus today. Let's just speak to Jesus where you are, <clears throat> quietly. Just appreciate him. Let's declare that he's the Lord of Lords because he is. Let's remind him that we are grateful that he went all the way and never looked back. Well, let's thank him for the finished work on that cross of Calvary. Because he went to the grave, that's why we are alive today. So Lord Jesus, we bring this service before you and we fully commit it into your hands. Thank you for the inspiration that you've given your sons and daughters to put this together. Thank you for the time that you multiplied unto them. They're all busy people, but you have made it possible for them to find time. And your grace has been abundantly poured out to them. Thank you, Lord, because we believe that this was always in your plan for us as a church even before the foundation of the world. This day was in your book and you impressed it on the hearts of your daughters and your sons. Oh, what a privilege that we can see the manifestation of mysteries hidden before the foundation of the world. Oh, such wonderful work of the Spirit of the living God unfolding the plans written in the annals by the great creator. So Lord, we commit every aspect of our meeting this morning into your hands. We ask for special grace on your sons and daughters as they take us through your passion, O oh Lord Jesus, and the resurrection power. Lord, be with them. Let every word spoken be your word. Let it find, O oh Lord, fertile soil in the hearts of the listeners, O oh Lord. Oh, may we live here, Lord, not as we've come in, but like the, the 
disciples with you walking on the road to Emmaus. Oh, they said, did not our hearts warm up within us, even as he spoke to us? Let our hearts, oh Lord, warm within us, even as we hear your voice today, and as we attempt to walk with you through your passion. Let all the glory remain with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. I'm going to add over to Sissy and the rest of the team. There's light. Your cross is shining, so people open your eyes. The cross stands above it all, burning bright in this life. The cross towers over it all. One hope, one deliverer. Savior reigning high above it all, above it all. Yeah. These chains are breaking, your love is shaking us. Break awakening, this world will finally see. The cross stands above it all, burning bright in this life. The cross towers over it all. One hope, one deliverer, Savior reigning high above it all. Above it all.
above it all, burning bright in this life. The cross towers over it all. One hope, one deliverer, Savior reigning high above it all. Above it all. Good morning, church. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Isn't it amazing that we could celebrate today? This is a day that the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, we're celebrating Resurrection Sunday. And as you can see behind me, it says, Worthy is the Lamb. The Lamb of God that was slain. For the redemption of sin. The Lamb of God that was prepared. Created specifically to bring an end to the slavery of death and sin. Today we are celebrating Easter Sunday with a difference. We want to take you on a journey as we go through this presentation. And we're inviting you to connect with the Lord. Let the words that we sing, the Bible verses that we read, the spoken words that will be presented, let them connect with you. And as you do, may you encounter the Lord. May you encounter the love of God in a unique way like never before. So join us as we welcome the worship team to present Worthy as the Lamb of God. Could all please stand to your feet and worship with us? That would be great. They wept, the morning sun was dead, the savior of the world was fallen, his body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon
hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb has overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb has overcome. Please be seated. All these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered, mended and whole, empty handed, but not forsaken. Your treasure in jars of clay. 
Man of Sorrows. Picture this. A man so blessed, the only begotten one, forsaking his crown of gold for a crown of thorns, forsaken by his herd and left to face his fate like a sheep that stood before his shearer. Picture this. He was a lamb that was led to his slaughter, roped, tied down, muzzled by the weight of conviction, ready to be pierced for our transgressions. Picture this. A blameless man becoming the peace offering, a perfect sacrifice, not stained by the colours of sin. Picture this. A man that was followed by thousands to be fed and healed, to end up alone as we hid all our faces from him. Betrayed by a twelfth, denied by another, telling the third to look after his mother as he faced the grave he was assigned to, cut off from the land of the living. Picture this. A man whose method of intercession was to inherit our transgressions, to redeem us from the road to eternal destruction. A man who shall receive the light of life after the fact and be satisfied with the multitude who have been made justified until the very ends of time. You'd think there's no one crazy enough to go through this, wouldn't you? Well, I know somebody who did. This man of sorrows he was despised and rejected a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief we turned our backs on him and looked the other way he was despised and we did not care
the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, it's free indeed. Now my death is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the This reading will be from Mark, chapter 14, verses 3 to 8. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor, so they scolded her harshly. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deeds will be remembered and discussed.
grew still as she made her way to Jesus. She stumbles through the tears that made her blind. She felt such pain, some spoke in anger, heard folks whisper, there's no place here for her face until at last she knelt before his feet and though she spoke no words everything she said was heard as she poured her love for the master from her box of alabaster I've come to pour my praise on him like By this time, it was about noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. When the Roman officers overseeing the execution saw what had happened, he worshipped God and said, Surely this man was innocent. 
And when all the crowd that came to see the crucifixion saw what had happened, they went home in deep sorrow. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet, the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Then I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Amen.
Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, his clothing was as white as snow. The gods shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women, don't be afraid. He said, I know you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. And now go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead, to, ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The nails did not keep him there. He had the power to save himself. The lion became the lamb and chose to stay there. He bore the cup all the way to the end. What was it that drove him? Obedience. He bore the cup all the way to the end. What was it that drove him? love. Perfect obedience and perfect love hung on a tree. Perfect obedience and perfect love went all the way for me. It was finished, but the story was far from over. Flip the page to scene three. Heralded by the stone, sealed no longer. The linen cloths and the handkerchief proclaimed the end of his slumber. Oh, where could my master be? 
Oh, my child, can't you see me? Rabbani, Rabbani, my Rabbani. This perfect love cannot be overcome. He is risen forever glorified. Through perfect love, the battle was won. Now in his name, you have eternal life. So go tell the world about this Christ. Yes, indeed, he is Allah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Please, may we stand. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You mind all standing and giving them a, an applaud? Let's stand. A standing ovation. Yeah. 
a standard elevation. I don't. I hope you, you guys mind coming in one at a time. Just walk across the stage. We want to celebrate you. Let's appreciate them. Let's appreciate them. Just file across. Come on, come on, come walk down. We want to celebrate you. Let's applaud them. Everybody stand. Yeah, let's stand, let's stand. Good. I need a microphone. Yeah, yeah, you can support CC. Support CC. Just tell us a little about where this came from. Um, I guess this sort of production came from um, a time of, well, it was during the prayer and fasting week. Um, it just sort of came to me um, that we should really just honor Jesus and his sacrifice as a worship team um, and uh, just put something on that would just show an ounce of the sacrifice that he made for us. Um, and that was just what I really felt burdened on my heart. So I just started to sort of write the different elements of the um, production and sort of put that together. And um, yeah, thankfully, everybody was on board and sacrificed pretty much every Wednesday and Saturday for about a month um, to practice and sort of make this production what it was today and obviously put their prayer behind it, which is most important. Um, but yeah, it's all just about honoring the sacrifice that Jesus made and just showing how, how worthy he is of our praise. And it was just a thought of whatever we can do to honor him, we will do as a worship team. And yeah, this is our love letter to Jesus. <clears throat> For those who don't know, she's my daughter-in-law. I can show you a bit of partiality, can't I? <laughs> we appreciate you. We appreciate you guys all. You know, really appreciate you. <clears throat> okay. Let's send them off the stage. Anne-Marie, stay. Anne-Marie, remain. Elijah, up here. Tommy, Steph, up here. The rest of you can sit down. Let's appreciate them as they come up. Come on, guys, let's appreciate them. Encour encourage them, encourage them. Hallelujah. Praise God. Woo. Mr. and Mrs. Adebayo. <laughs> Had the privilege of marrying them. When was that? Was that two Saturdays ago now? Huh? Was last Saturday? Oh! <laughs> My gray hair. Awesome privilege marrying this young couple. Members of our Life House group, which is a 20 to 30, 30 plus group now. They can go as far as 40, so you're allowed. Yeah. You know, faithful servants of the Lord. Honored Jesus in their relationship, you know, met with us, met with elders, working with them throughout, you know, the months of decision, you know, it was so amazing to see them really come under the, you know, guidance of more matured leaders in the house. And uh, it's such a privilege to... Uh, Celebrate, you know, your, your new life together. We just want to appreciate you yeah. for honoring Jesus in your relationship and for making him the centerpiece. May God really bless you guys. I'm sure Steph won't say something. Oh, that's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
It's been quite an interesting journey getting to this point. Um, we have a lot of testimonies that I'm sure we'll get to tell everyone at some point. Um, but we're really just grateful to God for bringing us this far. And our prayer is just that he'll continue to uphold us and direct us because, woo, marriage. <laughs> <laughs> this is new. We're, new. we're still new to this, so we're learning and just, yeah, just trying to walk alongside God and just praying for his guidance and his direction, really. I know there's, there's a thing that Life House usually does. I don't know. This is, it's usually the other way around. Yes, yes. On behalf of my husband. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was unexpected. Um, but yeah, honestly, um, I think before we came today, I, sa I said to her, being a husband is difficult. And it's only been a one week in. <laughs> And uh, but ultimately, I just wanted to say thank you guys for everyone that supported us, that's prayed for us, that's counseled us, honestly. Like I said in my speech, <laughs> I've had to go through a lot of stuff to get to this point. So I just thank God for always being there for us, providing for us. I know when we were planning for this wedding, we thought to ourselves, how are we going to do it? I think we did it within, what, five months or so? Or oh, three months, sorry. Um, but yeah, honestly, I just want to say thank you guys for being there for us and we really appreciate it. And honestly, Hick is a, is a loving community that I have never seen anywhere else. So thank you guys for working so hard to keep it the way it is. And I just pray that God blesses you. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Praise God. Okay. Now over to this side. You surprised her yesterday. Wow. Tell us about it. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> yes, we uh, got engaged yesterday. <laughs> um, I did my best to surprise Anne Marie, but um, she was one step ahead of me, probably every single every single step. So um, yeah. Um, it's been such a blessing. Lifehouse has been a blessing, meeting Anne-Marie there. And like Tommy said, Hick is just such a welcoming community. So we've really been um, nurtured every step of the way um, getting to this point. So um, we couldn't have done it without all the support um, and, of course, all the prayers. So we just, well, I thank Jesus that I came to this church and met Man. my future wife. Um, <laughs> Praise God. Uh, we, you have to hear Marie, please. Uh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> uh, I was speechless for the first time in my life. Oh. Um, yeah, just thank Jesus. Yeah. Um, I, made, <laughs> I made a joke in 2021 or two, and I said it in uh, Max and Tony's house, that if somebody doesn't propose to me within 18 months, I'm God. <laughs> and by the grace of God, it's been literally 11 months. To the time we started dating and got engaged yesterday. Yeah. Um, so we praise God. The worship team, Loki, made me know where my proposal team was. So shout out to the rest of you. Uh, so, guys, I was clued up. Um, but thank you all so much for all of your prayers, your love, your encouragement. Special shout out to Uncle Charles and Auntie Rita, who have been counseling us. They have been such a blessing um, in this whole process. We prayed and we prayed with like God who should be our mentors and God pointed them out and it was such a God-ordained thing. So, yeah, but thank you to every single one. Thank you for your prayers, for your love and please continue to pray for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. <clears throat> yes. Uncle Peter and Auntie Liz mentored you as well, but they are away with the youth. Our youth are away on the retreat this weekend, but about 36 or 40 young people and their instructors away for the weekend uh, prayer retreat, just being with other youth from across the country. So what are we saying? We, we decided that it's important to show this. This is a sign of life, isn't it? Because Jesus is the resurrection. Jesus is alive. And where Jesus is, there is life. Because the Bible said that in him was life. 
And that life was a light of men. So if men can key into that life, they would always have light and never walk in darkness. So I want to thank God for what he's doing for us in this community. This is how we live our life. Um, I'm losing count of how many marriages now that I've been privileged to, to be a part of. In just in the last less than 18 months, we've had quite a number. And I know yours is coming very soon as well. No pressure <laughs> on me. <laughs> so just want to really thank Jesus. Uh, just want to also encourage our young people. Like we said, 20s to 30s plus. I think really, you know, I think Life House is actually going to 40 now, which is just great. We just want to encourage you. There's a need to belong to a community where you can be built up. The Christian journey is about being in families, and this is what Hick is all about. And we just want to appreciate God for that. You want to stretch your hands towards them as I pray? I just thank Jesus for them. Just wish them what you wish for yourself and your own sons and daughters as you desire that they also will come into this institution ordained by God himself. Marriage is not a conception of man. It's God himself that ordained marriage. And for that, we are grateful. So, Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this great privilege of being able to celebrate, Lord, this new life as one before you in accordance with your word spoken at the foundation of the world, that the two shall no longer be two but one. Lord, you are the love. You are the one that seals and cements them together. Father, may you, O oh Lord, in your great mercy, just seal them, O oh Lord, on this journey. Lord, he said you shall be cleaved and be one. Lord, may nothing come between them except your love in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the journey ahead. Lord, be with them. May they fulfill destiny. May they fulfill the purpose for which you brought them together. For we know you know the end from the beginning. There is not coincidence that they found themselves here. You ordered the steps of the righteous. You clearly wrote their names against this commission, this church, from before the foundation of the world. And you, by your own finger of providence, brought them together through the journeys of life. And you brought them to this divine appointment in this church. Father, may we, by your grace, continue to lift their arms up in this union, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Take all the glory for all the marriages we've celebrated in the last one year and the many more that we shall be celebrating in the days and the weeks and months to come. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. We'll be going out for our outreach in St. Anne's Shopping Center. Don't let the weather stop you. It's not going to stop us, is it? Who's going to be there? Oh, yes. Yeah, six people. Okay. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> it's important to witness for Jesus. If you really believe that something is good, nobody ever keeps good things to themselves. We share good things, don't we? So if you keep something to yourself that's supposed to be good, then you have to ask yourself, is it really a good thing? Because if it's a good thing, you never keep it to yourself. True? Yep, that's my understanding. And if Jesus is good, and we have encountered him, and he has transformed our lives, because that's what Jesus does. Nobody encounters Jesus and remains the same. It's impossible. If we continue to struggle with the things that we were struggling with long before we came to Jesus, then we need to ask ourselves if we have truly accepted him as our Lord and Savior. Have we truly connected with him? Because the Bible tells us 
He is the resurrection and the life. Amen. Praise God. Yes, we read the story earlier on of Mary at the foot of Jesus. Lovely account. How she brought the alabaster jar, which was very expensive perfume, valued at at least one year's wages way back then. And she broke the alabaster jar at the foot of Jesus in the home of Simon the leper. If we had time, we would expound that scripture. And you'd be amazed at the series of events that took shape from that encounter. But then what was it that Mary saw? What was it that she saw that nobody else saw that made her break her alabaster jar at the foot of Jesus twice and not once? She actually broke the alabaster jar, washed the foot of Jesus, dried it with her hair on two occasions and not once. Everybody's looking at me. Praise God. Amen. Let's look at what the scripture says. The first occasion in John chapter 12 was six days before the Passover. The Bible tells us in John chapter 12 verse 1, then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, a matter served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Praise God. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, the Bible says, and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in the, in the money box. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Praise God. The first occasion of Mary breaking, spending the expensive perfume at the feet of Jesus was after the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. This was six days before the Passover. The beauty of the scripture is the explicitness and the accuracy. Because the Bible tells us clearly that the scriptures were not written by men out of their own imagination, but by men under the unction and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God himself, your maker. Praise God. What was it that she saw that made her break the alabaster jar twice? When was the second occasion? Mark chapter 13. Well, I think we'll take that from Matthew 26, actually, because that actually explains it. When the Lord himself so the first was six days before the Passover. <clears throat> Let's see what the second one. What it... Now it came to pass, Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, that he said to his disciples, you know that after two days is the Passover. 
So the first was what? Six days before the Passover. And this second was after two days is the Passover. And the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. And then he went on and talked about how the chief priest and all would continue, would do what they were going to do. But then the book of Mark, that same story in Mark, tells us in Mark chapter 14, verse 3, that Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper as he sat at the table. Praise God. And a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves. They went on and said what they said. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said to them, now listen, see the addition to what the Lord said on the second occasion. To see the beauty of perseverance when we key into the understanding when there's revelation of who Jesus is to us. The woman broke the alabaster jar six days before the Passover. It did not suffice her. She followed Jesus all the way to the house of Simon the leper, where it was filled with all the Pharisees and the men and their rigidity and all their, you know, self-righteousness. She knew what she was going to face there. She knew she was going to be, you know, accosted because the Bible recorded her as a harlot, as a prostitute. It wouldn't be the first time that prostitutes had been welcomed into the lineage of our Lord Jesus. You remember the story of Rahab the prostitute who ended up being the mother of Jesus' forebears in the flesh. That is the mercy of God. That is the mercy of the God we serve. There is no one too wicked. There is no one too far gone as not be able to enter into the promise and the mercy of God. Hallelujah. She must have known the story of this Rahab woman as a Jewish lady. She must have known the story that once, once a prostitute like myself who found mercy, and I would not let go. I would grab hold of mercy. Praise God. She saw something that nobody else saw. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come, she has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. It now adds something that was not said at the first encounter. As surely I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. That's the benefit of perseverance. The second time around, she had her name and her deed enshrined in the gospel. There's no way you talk about Jesus without talking about Mary the prostitute. Hallelujah. She saw something. She saw mercy. And she keyed into mercy. She held on to the feet of mercy. She poured all that she had, her life savings, 
in order to grab hold of mercy. But mercy was sitting in the house of Simon the leper. A leper who obviously had mercy, but never recognized. For a leper was meant to be ostracized, but here was Jesus in the home of Simon the leper. Who had encountered mercy yet was full of judgment and condemnation. And he looked at a woman who likewise sought mercy. And he condemned and reviled her. How often do we do that? When we condemn and revile people. Oh, he's a sinner. Oh, look at her life. But never forget that Jesus is the mercy of God. Hallelujah. Remember our Lord's conversation with, with the Jews when they were asking him to show them the sign as to why they should believe that he was the one that was sent by the Lord. And they actually chastised him for not keeping the Sabbath and being disrespectful of it. And the Lord went on and explained to them. He said, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Amen. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And then when we look at the events at Calvary, Calvary, the day that we celebrate, was the day of atonement written before the foundation of the world. The Lord, the maker of all things, had determined one day for the atonement of the sin of the whole world. But that day was hidden. But the Jewish nation were told to continually recite and practice that day of atonement. So we saw it in the whole annals and the life of the, of the nation where the temple which had the mercy seat, the high priest could go into that temple only once a year to atone for the sin of the whole nation. But then he went in with the blood of goats and lambs and all sorts. And none of them could actually bring an atonement for the nation. So it was a practice run for the day of atonement which nobody knew because the lamb that had to be slain in order to bring the perfect atonement needed to be delivered by God. Man could never bring animals. And the Lord declared that that lamb was slain at the foundation of the world, the Bible tells us. But you remember in the matter of Abraham and his son Isaac, when the Lord tested Abraham and told him to sacrifice his son Isaac. And the Bible said that they went on a three-day journey to Mount Moriah. Incidentally, Mount Moriah is the same Mount of Calvary where Jesus was crucified. And the son Isaac and Abraham represented God the Father and the Lord Jesus. The Lord wanted him to have a taste of what it is for him, God the Father, to sacrifice his own son on behalf of the world. And the Bible records that Abraham got instruction and he went on a three-day journey. And he got to Mount Moriah. And Abraham was to sacrifice his son. And this was a strapping lad full of strength and energy. Way stronger than Abraham by any stretch of the imagination. But yet, Abraham was to sacrifice him. There was no way Abraham could have lifted his son and put him on an altar. Isaac had to have willingly laid on that altar. So he was a type of Christ who went willingly to the cross for your sin and my sin. Because on the way, Isaac asked his father, he said, Father, we have the fire, we have the wood, 
But where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And he said, the Lord will provide, which is why we call the Lord Jehovah Jireh. The Lord is the provider. Hallelujah. And when they got there, truly the son laid willingly on the altar. And the father pulled out the knife willingly. And as he raised it to bring it down, the voice of the Lord stopped him. He said, no, Abraham. Now I know. Now I know that you love God. Do you know that you love God? Does God know that you love him? Can we have the same testimony as Abraham had? Can the Lord say by you and I, Albert, now I know you love me. It's not enough that I stand here preaching. That doesn't mean anything. Anybody can preach. What matters is what's in the heart. What does the Lord see when he looks at you, Albert? Can he say concerning you, now I know you love me. But he said so concerning this aged man, Abraham. And the Bible said that Abraham looked and there was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And the Lord said, take that ram. And he took the ram and sacrificed the ram. But remember that it's not a ram that was for atonement. The atonement will only come with the lamb had to be slain. So Abraham did not receive a lamb, he received a ram. So the lamb was still awaited because Abraham spoke prophetically. God will provide the lamb. And all through the decades, 400 years in exile, and on the night of the Passover, the lamb was slain, but yet it glowed. The blood on the lintel was a representation. That blood was in the blood of the lamb provided by God. And then the nation of Israel continued 400, 800, 1,000 years later. And the temple was built, the great temple. The tabernacle became the temple. And in the temple, the what made the temple the temple was the mercy seat. Without the mercy seat, the temple was not a temple. Because there the Lord will meet with his people. And then once a year, the high priest will go in to the Holy of Holies with the blood of lamb in order to obtain mercy on behalf of the whole nation. But that was a sacrifice that was repeated year on year. It did not bring atonement. The Lord was tired after a while of that sacrifice. Which is what the Lord Jesus answered them when they said, why are you not keeping the Sabbath and all that? He said, go and find out what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. It's like I'm wearied by your sacrifice. I'm looking for someone that can unleash my mercy because I am abundant, full of mercy. The Lord, the Lord, full of mercy. The Lord wanted somebody that will release that mercy. He says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And Jesus looked at them. He said, go and learn what this means. I am actually the one that the Father desires because I am mercy. Praise God. And they had no understanding. But how did we know? The Bible tells us in John chapter 1, all through the journeys, and we came to the last of the prophet John, who was sent as a witness, and he had instruction from God the Father. He said, the one upon whom you see the Spirit descending, that is the Lamb. Hallelujah. So this Lamb that was awaited for hundreds and thousands of years, the Lamb that God promised Abraham 
or Abraham promised his son that God would deliver. That lamb was manifested in John chapter 1. Which is why John, the prophet, the last of them, stood on the bank of the Jordan River and declared, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's our Lord Jesus. Praise God. And then the purpose of the temple, like we know, is a place where God chooses to dwell. The temple was the temple because of the mercy seat. The mercy seat was a place of seeking atonement. But God did not intend for men to come once a year begging for mercy. He wanted to flood eternity, the whole creation with his mercy. But there needed to be the right sacrifice to unlock that. And no one was found worthy in the whole world to be able to offer that sacrifice until the lamb provided by God himself. And the Bible declared, just like our Lord Jesus spoke, he said, a body you have prepared for me. So the Lord himself prepared a body for Jesus and poured himself into that body. So God was in operation through Jesus Christ in that body. So it was God himself who actually came to that cross to die for you and I. Hallelujah. And then we saw the lamb. But from the time the lamb was revealed, the physical temple became obsolete. Because the purpose of the temple was to obtain mercy. We don't have time to expound it. But when you go back and look at the scriptures, and we go to the Matthew chapter 27 and we read, in fact, from 26 onwards again, we see where Jesus was chastised for saying that if you destroy this temple, I will raise it up in three days. And they were like, what do you mean it took 46 years to build this temple? And you say you destroy it and raise it in, one, in three days? And because of that, they were angry at him. And even as he hung on the cross, the chastisement was you that said you would destroy the temple in three, and raise in three days. Now let's see you come down from the cross. And there was reviling. The Pharisees, the scribes, the people, even the robbers that were crucified on both sides of him, they were also abusing him. You said you raised a new temple in three days. Praise God. And then what did the Bible tell us as we close on this discourse? I'm just going to read for you just so that we can be absolutely clear about what the scriptures tell us. Amen? Is that good? Is this doing you any good? Amen. Thank you. Yes. I'm going to read Matthew Look at Matthew 26. Or better still, let's look at 27. Let's go. Matthew 27. So this was Jesus hanging on the cross as we come to the end of his passion. And the Bible tells us from Verse 47, some of those who stood there when Jesus cried, Eli, Eli, say, God, why have you forsaken me? In verse 47, some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling on for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Hallelujah. Now what happened? Jesus cried and yielded up his spirit. The very next verse we hear, then, then are also, the word then is a critical exclamation in the scripture. Then, Behold, 
the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Praise God. As Jesus cried the last time and yielded up his spirit, the Bible said, then the curtain that has shielded the most holy place for decades, hundreds of years, thousands actually, was parted. Amen. What was the significance of that? As we come to the end, brings us back to what Jesus said. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Sacrifice over the years had not changed anything. Jesus yielded up his spirit. Apostle tells us in Romans chapter 3 verse 25 that God has presented Jesus as a propitiation which is another word for say, as the sacrifice of atonement. And when Jesus offered himself and his spirit and he died on the cross, the sacrifice was accepted by God. And the moment the sacrifice was accepted, the old temple became obsolete, which is why the curtain was open. Even though the ark was still there, even though the messy seat was still there, the shoe, table of shoe bread was there, everything was as it was, it was of no value anymore. Why? Because the temple was a place where God chose to dwell. Now the Lord, the Father, has decided to dwell in this vessel that he created by his own hand, which was our Lord Jesus. Because the Bible tells us that the fullness of the Godhead dwelled in Jesus. Amen. So God had taken a different place to, to dwell in. So no longer would he dwell in buildings by the hands of men. He was from now going to dwell in the body which he fashioned. So Jesus became the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And that's how you and I, when we believe in Jesus, we actually have the spirit of God dwelling in us now. So we are the temples of the living God. There's no longer a need for a physical temple. That is the product of resurrection. Amen. This is what Jesus bought for you and I. The cutting, the temple obsolete. The real temple is you and I. If you're willing, if you're willing for your creator, your maker, to live in this vessel, which is your body, fashioned by him, not by the hands of men, he created you. Would you welcome him in to this temple? Or would you be like the nation of Israel, the Bible tells us in Ezekiel? The Lord lamented, they have driven me away from my temple. The Bible said that the glory of the Lord rose and they saw it depart from the temple. Hey, look at that. And when you go to that Ezekiel account, the Bible said the glory of the Lord departed and went on the mountain directly opposite Jerusalem. The same mountain on which Jesus was crucified. That's what Ezekiel told us. The Mount of Calvary. Jesus, like the lamb who took away the sin of the nation, had to be crucified outside the camp. The lamb had to be crucified, had to be sacrificed outside of the camp. Which is why Jesus had to be crucified outside of the city of Jerusalem. For you and I. For you are the temple of the living God. If you so desire. 
And if you will for him to come and dwell in you. Truly, Lord Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise a new one. Indeed, he raised a new temple in three days. Because as he, as, he raised, as he was raised from the dead, he was a new temple. Amen. No longer was there a need for the old temple. And what did we see? Less than 40 years after Jesus died, the physical old temple was demolished. The Romans came and destroyed it. When they were trying to quell the rebellion, the five-year rebellion by the Jewish nation. And the only thing left of that old temple was a strip of wall about 50 meters long. And that's the wall that is called the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem today. Why is it a Wailing Wall? The Pharisees, the Jewish nation that missed the new temple, they still go to the wall every day and they're wailing and crying for the erection of a new physical temple. But the temple of the Lord now dwells in you and I. No longer is there a need for a physical temple. Praise God. Let's rise. Let's rise. As we ponder and as we consider what we have heard this morning, we will be going out in a few minutes for our outreach event in this St. Anne shopping complex. And I'd like you to consider. We believe that the Lord orders the steps of the righteous. And there's no coincidence in the things of God. It is not by chance that you are here. You might just be a visitor. And say, oh, well, I don't belong to this church. I only just came. But we are glad that you came because the Lord orders the steps of the righteous. And I want to invite you this morning, if you may, if you're here and you've not had an encounter with Jesus, or you've not really had this experience of what Albert is talking about this morning, I would encourage you to consider accepting the Lord Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. There is no sin too great. No sin too great. Oh no. Murderers have found Jesus and their lives transformed. Prostitutes like Mary encountered mercy because Jesus is the mercy of God. He says, when I look on you, I, see no, I do not see your sin anymore. I see the blood of Jesus. That's what the father sees when he looks at you and I. You might be saying, well, Albert, I don't really need Jesus. I'm cool. I've got my job. I've got, I don't have any need. I only just came to watch this production. God bless you. There's no condemnation. There's no pressure. It's only if we willingly open the doors of our hearts, he comes in. He said, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone opens to me, I will come in and I will sup with him. I will have fellowship with him. The Lord we serve never puts pressure on anyone. But be it known to you that you're not here by chance. We believe God had your name written to be here today from before the foundation of the world. It might sound spooky, but it's the truth. Would you open your heart this morning? Would you receive him into your heart? Would you make your temple available, your body available as the temple of the living God? That he may dwell in you. For that's the price that Jesus paid for you and I. That we may have a personal relationship with God, the Father. So as we close in prayer before we go out for the outreach, I'm going to ask us to just quietly pray. I want to pray with your eyes closed, your eyes open, it doesn't matter. But if you're here this morning 
And you think, I oh, would know, I've heard this story and I really would like to have a relationship with Jesus. I want to welcome you to just put up your hand where you are and we'll pray with you before we close the service. And I believe our ushers around to just encourage us because I'm, I'm not able to see upstairs. So that anybody in the house who thinks, you know, I'd like to have this experience with Jesus, just put up your hand where you are and we will just pray before we close. Anyone? The rest of us praying quietly. If we're in Christ already, let's be grateful. Let's thank him for the work that he has done. Let's thank him for going all the way to Calvary. Let's thank him for giving us the privilege of knowing him. But anyone that wants to come into that experience, just put up your hand. I will pray and we close as we exit today. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. So, Father, Lord, we bless your name. Oh, we thank you, Lord Jesus. What a privilege. What an honor. That you have called us and brought us, oh, Lord, into fellowship with the Father. Lord, there is nothing in us beside you. Our finery is because you have kept us. All we have to hear is one news, one bad news from the doctors. And the finery all disappears. But for your grace, you have sustained us. The breath in us, our waking up every morning and jumping off our bed and rushing out all over the place is because of you and your grace. And for that, we are grateful, Lord Jesus. There's nothing in us beside you. And Lord, I bring your sons and daughters before you this afternoon. Lord, we ask that your grace will abound unto us. You know where we each are on our journey. You know where we are in our hearts at this minute. You know the conversations we're having with ourselves in our hearts. There's nothing hidden from you. Lord, I ask that you will give grace where there's need for grace. Oh, would you give strength, oh Lord, where there's need for strength. Would you give courage, O oh Lord? Oh, where there's a need for courage to stand and speak for you, Lord. And to declare for you, irrespective of what men say. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, we give you all the glory and all the honor. Thank you for unlocking the mercy of God for us all. Which is why the apostle could say, Therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace for the days ahead and the journey ahead. We're able to come boldly even though the high priest could never come in boldly. We can come boldly because of your finished work. O oh, thou mercy of God. Jesus is the mercy of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for this production that we have been a part of today. Thank you for the time you gave to your sons and daughters, even in the midst of their very busy schedule. Oh, what a privilege. Thank you, Lord. Take all the glory for all that's happened in this house today. Thank you for the marriages, oh Lord, that we're celebrating in the house. Thank you for the new ones that we will yet celebrate. Thank you for the baby dedications we've been celebrating and continue to celebrate. Thank you for the signs of life in this family. Oh, we give you all the glory and all the honor. Lord, we are humbled by your mercy. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, may it please you, Lord, to continue to be with us as a family. May it please you, O oh Lord, to bring us into greater knowledge of you. May it please you, Lord, to bring us into that place of true submission before your throne. 
Oh, thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Thank you. God bless you. We expect to see you at the outreach as the Lord leads you. Hallelujah. Amen. I go out this way. <laughs>